invite you to join me this morning in the book of Isaiah, chapter 55. Isaiah, the 55th chapter. We're going to read a few verses here to begin, beginning at verse 6. Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This is the word of the Lord. May he add his blessings to it. Since I was a very little boy, I have listened to invitations being extended at the end of sermons. Some have been good, and some I'm sure not so good. I try not to be too critical, though, because I offer them, and sometimes they're good and sometimes not so good when I preach. I'm actually not sure how effective public invitations are in our day and time. It's said that the, the first invitation, at least in the way we do it, in Churches of Christ and in other restoration movement groups, was offered by a man named Walter Scott back in the early 1800s over in uh, Lisbon, Ohio. At that time, it was known as New Lisbon, Ohio. He was preaching there in sort of an evangelistic campaign and during the week, Brother Scott had met a man and he invited him this one particular evening to come to the meeting and to hear him preach. And he had discussed things with this man and thought he was a good prospect for conversion. Uh, and so Scott <clears throat> planned to specifically make a call at the end of his preaching that night for a public response. That wasn't commonly done, uh, if at all. And he did so in the way we do uh, today by custom. And he even encouraged uh, a specific song to be led at the conclusion of the message to encourage a response. And indeed, it, uh, this man that he had been working with came forward and he was baptized into Christ that night. And what I think is called the Little Beaver Creek that runs through Lisbon, Ohio. Well, you'd, you'd like it to work that way all the time. Um, of course, it often doesn't. I'll tell you that I have one major concern about our practice of the public invitation, and that is that I wonder if we think that as long as the invitation has been offered at the close of the sermon, that we have therefore done our evangelism for the week. And I wonder if, if some of us think that that's the only way that we might express evangelistic outreach, by a sermon and by an invitation at the end of a sermon. And therefore, unless you're the preacher, the evangelist, then you don't really have any responsibility beyond singing that song. That's a concern I have about our practice. But overall, I think that we should call on people to respond when we present the gospel, whether it is in public or in private, that we ought to call for a response and that our preaching and our teaching ought to call people to make a change in their lives because that's certainly what the scripture does, um, that we ought to as well calling people to make a change where it needs to be made, for people, for instance, to be baptized that need to be baptized, and for people that need to repent of sin to repent 
That's a good thing, whether, again, it's done in public in an assembly like this or whether it is done in private. And I also think it's a good thing to offer to pray for people, whether in public or private. But I'll tell you, as a preacher, I feel inadequate in my efforts to do so. And uh, my efforts to invite often fall short. It's one reason that I love this chapter that I want us to spend time in this, this morning, Isaiah chapter 55. It may be the Bible's greatest invitation. At least it, it's one of the greatest, certainly. You know, Jesus, Jesus offered um, words of invitation at times. You might remember an example, um, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, where Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That is an invitation, you see. And then you might remember also how John ends the Bible in Revelation chapter 22, where he says, the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Well, Isaiah 55 has some similar wording to that. I read the middle portion of it a few minutes ago, but look, look with me, if you would, at the beginning of the chapter, verses 1 through 5. Notice how it begins. Come. Come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul might live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I make, made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall come, call a nation that you do not know. And a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel. For he has glorified you. I think it's helpful for us to remember what this part of this long book of Isaiah is all about. Really, from chapter 40 to chapter 55, the prophet is speaking prophetically really two centuries into the future to a group of Jews who are living in Babylonian exile. These people have been there for more than a generation. They've been there about 70 years. Remember how they got there. Their nation had been destroyed and they had been carried away into Babylon and lived there in exile. And that was a punishment for their rebellion against the Lord God. And God is now calling them through Isaiah's words to prepare to go back, to return to their homeland, and to rebuild. Most of them don't seem to want to hear this. They're, they're not interested so much in this message. They are satisfied with their situation. And so throughout this section, section of the book, verses, uh, chapters 40 through 55, God has been giving them reasons to change their thinking, reasons to change their mind. He's contrasted himself with the false gods of Babylon. He's spoken of his incredible power and his desire to bless them and to take care of them. And he's spoken in great detail about a servant that he is preparing to, to send them who will bring them salvation. And so after all these messages of hope and, 
and these offers of great promises, what does God do at the end of all that here in chapter 55? Well, he extends an invitation, and it is indeed a great invitation. He starts in these opening verses that we read a moment ago by saying, I know that you're thirsty. I know that you're hungry. And I also know that you don't have any money. So I want you to come to my banquet and fill up on food and drink. Come buy as much as you need, but it won't cost you anything. Now, it almost seems contradictory, doesn't it? But it, it's God's way of underlining the wonderful offer that he's making to them. He says, you can come and buy all you want. And by the way, I'll give you all the money to buy it. Now, who in their right mind would turn down such an invitation? And yet... People do all the time. Every week, people turn that invitation down. All God wants from them is their attention. He wants them to listen to him. Look at verse 2. Look at verse 3. That's what he asks. God says, if you will be a people that will listen to me, really listen to me, then we'll have a great relationship. We will have an unbreakable relationship. Bond. That's what he promises in verse 3. So th this ancient invitation to the exiles in Babylon is really no different than the one God offers to us today. I think about it. God wants us to listen. He wants us to hear. And, and really focus on his words. And he has this unbelievable offer for us. It's salvation that we don't have to pay for. He's bought it, you see. We couldn't pay for it even if we wanted to because we don't have the means. Only Jesus has the means. <clears throat> Only his precious blood, you see, will secure that salvation. So God says to people today, come get what you need. I'm buying. What an invitation. If you look on at that little section we read as we began, verses 6 through 9, there's more to this. Uh, we learn, for instance, that this invitation, while it's a great one, is also urgent. It's open now, but it will not always be open, this invitation. There is a limit to it. Notice the wording there. It says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Does that not imply that a time is coming when the Lord may not be found? And when he is not near? Indeed, it does. So this is an urgent invitation, as really they all are. I wonder if we realize how urgent the invitation is. It's, it's part of my concern with our practice of it. Has it become so old and such a habit that we don't appreciate the urgency? We hear the word of God preached each week. Do we really listen? Do we understand that there will come a time when there is no more preaching? There will come a time when there are no more invitations, no more opportunities to obey the word, no more time to repent, to make a change that is needed, the day is coming. It may be that that day is the day when we die. Our individual death. Scripture says, of course, it is appointed unto man 
wants to die and then comes judgment. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. That may be when invitations end for us individually. Or it may be at the final return of Jesus. When, as scripture says, the trumpet sounds and the dead are raised. We know that some will be raised to life, but many to a second death. There's no more invitations after Jesus comes back. The invitation, you see, is always urgent, especially when the word of God has convicted me of some sin, some error, some wrong, some disobedience in my life. God's invitation then is urgent for me. So we have this great invitation this open invitation to everyone. Come, everyone who thirsts, verse 1. And God makes this incredible offer to, to give us everything we need and he'll pay the bill. He just wants us to be a people who will listen to him. And if we do, then we'll have an unbreakable relationship. But it is limited. There is a time limit. The time is coming when this incredible invitation is no longer offered. So this invitation has an urgency to it. And then this chapter closes with this last section. It runs from verse 8 through verse 13. It's very interesting here. There are four fours in these verses f-o-r-s four fours that you don't want to miss four different fours that will give you three reasons why we should respond to god's invitation and the fours that i refer to come at the beginning of verse 8 9 10 and 12 four fours they give us three reasons we should respond to this great invitation. The first two fours make the same point. Verses 8 and 9, notice the language. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, God says. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I guess there are different ways that one might explain what God is saying to us here in these words, but let me suggest the simplest translation I know of the meaning here. God says, I know more than you. I know more than you about everything. Now I'm convinced that until a person understands and appreciates that point they will not respond to God God says I know more than you there's a lot of people that don't believe that a lot of people in our world think they figured out some things that God's never figured out maybe some here this morning if a person thinks they're smarter than God, or wiser than God, or at least as smart or wise as him, they'll never submit to him. Really, it all come down to a question of whether we believe God is God, or whether we think we are. If we think we're God, why respond? You see, why make a change? If I think that I have to have every question answered to my satisfaction, and I have a thousand questions, if I think I have to have every question answered to my satisfaction, what I'm really saying is, I really don't need God. 
I can handle it. I can figure it out. I don't need his help. And God says, you're lying to yourself. God says, I know more than you about everything. So trust me. The third four is in verse 10. Notice what it says. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Another reason we should respond to God's invitation. Everything he said, everything he's promised, will come to pass. His word is completely reliable. This offer God makes is a 100% ironclad guarantee. You don't need a warranty on God's promise because God's word never fails. He has offered salvation through his servant whom we know as Jesus Christ. And it is a certain thing. We will be saved if we respond. If we listen. And if we respond. And then the final four comes in verse 13, or verse 12, excuse me, where it says, For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The last reason to respond God offers in this chapter is a peek at the end. What's the end result of all this? What happens if we come to him, if we listen to him, if we truly seek the Lord? What happens if we respond while there's still time and opportunity to God's gracious offer to us? Well, we will be ushered into the joys of the Lord. We will have true peace something you cannot find in this world. There will be great celebration. And everything that used to be hard and difficult, which we all experience every day, in this fallen, old, sinful world, all of that will be made right and wonderful. And we will experience eternity with God who made us. And who saved us. It's the Bible's great invitation. I hope and pray. You've learned something from it. About 41 years ago. It was a Sunday night. The good news was preached at Market Avenue Church of Christ in Canton, Ohio. The invitation was extended. A song was led. Oh, why not tonight? And there was a young teenage boy who walked down the aisle and responded to God. He had heard and believed. He was ready to repent and confess. And he was baptized into Christ that night. I have never for a second regretted that decision. There's been a time or two since then when I walked down the aisle to confess wrong, to commit to doing better, I've never regretted those responses either. 
I've always believed God is coming back. I've always believed one day there'll be no more opportunities. I've always believed God was smarter than me. Now, I may not have believed anybody else was. That's my arrogance. But I've always believed God was smarter than me. And that I could rely on his word. That I could really count on every promise he's made. And ever since I responded to the, the great invitation, I have looked forward to what God has in store for me when this life is over. This morning, the great invitation is yours. How will you respond? Let us stand and sing. Live for Jesus on my ground, his disciples.